profiling system. So different actions that you do as a player in, in the next Silent Hill uh, are actually going to open up or close off certain side quests so that every time you play through the game you might get a slightly different experience than the last time. Combat. Um, we, as I mentioned earlier, we weren't going to go the Silent Hill uh, Shattered Memories route and say, okay, no combat. And we didn't want to go full on uh, Homecoming style. So we've gone for kind of a blended approach. So there's still monsters, you can still fight them, um, but it's not always a good idea to fight them. Basically, it's, it's the fight or flight thing. Um, we went for an improvised weapon system. Um, you've heard a little bit about that in the press releases. Uh, I can't tell you much, but I can say that the player will be encouraged to constantly be looking for things to defend himself with. Um, so it's not going to be, you know, heavy machine guns and things like that. It's going to be like, wow, this table would be great to, to knock a monster on the head with. Um, it's going to be about, you know, just finding anything, just as you would be in a real life situation. If you were being chased by a monster, I guarantee you, you'd find anything that you could possibly fight with and, and try to defend yourself with. Um, the uh, weapons specifically don't reduce the player's vulnerability or their desperation. So it's, it's really about just like constantly looking at every environment. As soon as you walk into a room in the next Silent Hill and you hear a monster growling in the corner, your instinct is going to be, okay, what can I grab to, to pick up and defend myself with? Um, there are going to be some more powerful weapons. I can't tell you which ones, uh, but they are there. But they're going to be few and far between. And I guarantee you when you find one of them, you are going to be clutching it to your chest like it was the only thing you know, existing in the universe at that moment. Um, our firepower is going to be extremely limited. If you looked at things like uh, the recent uh, movies *Mist*, the, the, uh, *The Mist* from Stephen King, or *The Road*, um, both of those uh, involve firearms. We had characters that spent most of the film armed with a handgun, but that handgun only had a few bullets, uh, and that actually had an incredible amount of tension in those stories because you knew those bullets were going to get used before the end of the movie. You just weren't sure on who or how. Um, so we're kind of using the same same angle for firepower. Our monsters. What can I say about our monsters? Um, I can't go into specifics about what monsters you'll encounter in the next Silent Hill, but I can tell you about the process that we went through to create them. Um, so, you know, what are monsters? They are uh, an imaginary creature that's typically large, ugly, and frightening. It's from the uh, Latin monstrum, important or warning. Um, you know, they're, they're usually physical manifestations and personifications of our human fears and anxieties. And they're very specific. If you look at like the history of monsters throughout all fiction, they're very specific each time. Uh, that's why we had like you know space aliens that were basically a metaphor for communism in the 50s. And you know now we have a lot of stories about uh, biological uh, monsters, you know viruses and things, because that's something that people are very afraid of. Um, environmental monsters, things that come out of the earth from a, an environmental disaster. Those are the kind of uh, fears that we have today. Um, but in video games, especially in horror games, monsters exist solely to modify or drive your player's behavior. Um, they're there to punish your player for incorrect behavior. Uh, incorrect behavior being things like standing out in the open, uh, not looking for a weapon to defend yourself, not finding the safe point in time, uh, not being able to outrun the monster. Uh, those are the behaviors that we want the player to have to succeed in the game. So the monster's there to punish the player when they do the incorrect behavior. Um, they're there to challenge your player's bravery and skill. There are threshold guardians. So the monsters, in other words, they have to be tough and they have to pose a challenge to the player so he feels like he's accomplished something. But the key is your monster also has to be vanquished. Okay? He has to be vanquishable. Now you can look at Silent Hill and say, well, they had Pyramid Head. You couldn't beat Pyramid Head, um, but you could run like hell away from him. So that, that's how you could vanquish Pyramid Head, is just you don't let him catch you. Um, Another thing that we looked at when we created our monsters, we wanted to make sure that every monster was in some way a reflection of the negative aspects of our hero. So we did like a complete psychological profile of Murphy, figured out what he's afraid of, what were the traumatic moments in his life, what did, what's the baggage, the emotional baggage that he's carrying around with him, and now how can I create a monster out of each of those elements? Um, when I worked on Jericho, I spent a, a few years actually working with, uh, with Clive Barker. We became friends, and, and he was kind enough to kind of mentor me on, on horror. Um, and one of the coolest things that he taught me, which I, I then in turn brought back to the Botcher guys, was what Clive called the, uh, the three degrees of violation. Um, and those degrees are the first degree, infliction, second degree, uh, infestation, 
third degree possession. Okay, so your first degree is what we call infliction. Uh, as Clive so uh, colorfully calls it, he says it's the breaking of body surfaces, okay, the breaking of bones, the cutting of skin, bruising flesh. Um, what it comes down to is it's the violation of your human superiority. Okay, we are supposed to be at the top of the food chain. Nothing is supposed to be hunting us. We live in cities now. We don't live in the woods. We are not supposed to be afraid of wolves, sharks, dragons, etc. Um, so that first degree of violation, it's about the indignation of being preyed upon. Something's knocking you off the top of the food chain and making you into food. Um, so Clive says, you know, the, the lower level monsters, you know, sort of like our cannon fodder monsters, are those that only do the first degree of violation to your body. They're the ones that just inflict harm on you. Um, the good thing about those monsters is that the worst they can do to you is kill you. So Jaws, perfect example. It's a, just a big fish. It's a big dinosaur fish. Uh, but it has the gall to eat you when you're, you're uh, taking a skinny dip in the ocean. Second degree, infestation. So if you want to create a, uh, you know, a next monster up that's a little worse than your cannon fodder monsters, you go to the second degree of violation. And that's about infestation. Infestation, we're talking about the colonization or transformation of body tissues and membranes. Clive is always careful to say, and membranes. Um, it's about body horror, okay, what people call body horror. Um, a really good example of that would be something like the fly, Cronenberg's uh, the fly, when uh, Jeff Goldblum's character slowly transforms into an insect. Remember, his uh, fingernails began to fall off, and his teeth began to fall out, um, and his skin started rotting off. And it didn't happen really quickly. It wasn't like a werewolf transformation where 30 seconds of pain and screaming and then it's over. It was a really slow process. Uh, it was prolonged horror. It was impending death and impending doom. Um, it's like the despoiling of your body as the sacred temple. So your second degree of monster, uh, they're going to give you self-destruction, no, no doubt about it. They are going to kill you. But the good thing is, is that there's still a release. Uh, you, can, you can still kill yourself, you can throw yourself in front of a bus, whatever, and the horror is over. Um, the fly, remember, at the end of that film, he stuck a shotgun to his head and, and he killed himself. So, you know, like the, the alien chest busters, perfect example of that type of body horror, of being infested by something. Then we get to the third degree, the big badasses of, of the horror and monster world, possession. Uh, possession is uh, the hijacking of not just the body, but also of the mind. Uh, it's, this is where you start getting into the really psychological horror element. It's like uh, Harlan Ellison's I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream, which was a science fiction horror story about uh, humans being experimented upon by a, uh, uh, an artificial intelligence that was just torturing them, just enough to cause them extreme uh, horror, but not enough to kill them. So it's, uh, um, it's that thing where you know, you've been paralyzed and you're going into surgery, and they think that they've put you under, and you've, you've been anesthetized. But wait, I'm still feeling and hearing and seeing everything happening, but I can't tell them I'm still awake. It's that type of horror. Uh, in, in that third degree, in possession, your victim is conscious of the horror. They know what's happening to them, but they can't affect the release. Uh, they can't kill themselves. They're no longer in control of their own faculties, so they can't escape. And the worst part of it is, the piece de resistance is that death itself isn't even an assured release. Think about, uh, well, think about Reagan and the exorcist, right? Uh, if at the end of the exorcist, instead of the priest jumping out the window and falling to his death, what if it was Reagan that had jumped out of the window and fallen to her death? So the girl died possessed by a demon. But what happened to her soul afterwards? If, uh, if you have any spirituality or religion in you whatsoever, or if there's even an, an inkling of a doubt that, that, that uh, there's a soul or that there's an afterlife, you'd have to be wondering what happened to Reagan if she died. You know, if she, if she wasn't exercised, um, is her soul in eternal torment? Is she now eternally the plaything of this demon? Um, so that's actually, uh, according to Clive's uh, cosmology anyway, is the worst type of uh, violence you can have inflicted on you by a monster is to be possessed. So that's the kind of thing that we're looking at with our monsters. I can't go into specifics, but you can, you can kind of use that as a road map and you can figure out what the direction that we're taking our monsters in for the next Silent Hill. Um, interesting to note, uh, that uh, law enforcement agencies, uh, people that deal with like abused children, abused uh, family, domestic abuse, etc., they typically talk about three levels of violence. Um, and their three levels of violence, it starts with the psychological, it starts with threats, bullying, uh, dehumanizing, humiliating you, then it goes into physical harm, 
Uh, it's again, it's that thing that Clive calls the breaking of body surfaces. So, you know, somebody beats their wife or they beat their child. That's like the second level of violence. The third degree of violence, uh, according to, you know, police officers would say, is that extreme physical violence, murder, rape, assault, maiming, chopping somebody's arm off, chopping their head off, you know, it's, it's, we're talking like really extreme violence. Um, so as far as like our human society is concerned, those are like the three levels of escalating violence. But if you put those side by side with Clive's three degrees of violation, you'll actually end up seeing that the psychological stuff, uh, like the psychological violence, emotionally abusing somebody, like emotionally abusing a child, let's say, is actually on par with the possession level. Because what happens at possession is you yourself become a monster. And as you've seen in society, if you abuse a person long enough uh, without killing them, there's a very good chance that that person is now psychologically damaged and they're gonna become a monster themselves. Uh, and as Mary Shelley showed us, the best way to deal with a monster is you don't create one in the first place. So, uh, how do we design our monsters? Um, a lot of times when you first try to cook up a monster, the first thing you start with is the physical description. You start saying, oh, it's got red eyes and big fangs and bat wings, and you start describing it in terms of the physical. Uh, but when you're gonna design a good video game monster, you actually wanna take into account a whole bunch of other questions before you ever get to the physical. Um, so these are the kind of questions that we started asking about our monsters before we started uh, coming up with their final look. Um, what's the monster's combat role? You know that if a monster's in a horror game, you're, you're gonna fight him. Uh, what type of, of a fighter is he? Is, is this monster a sniper? Is this monster a heavy weapon? Is he a tank? Is he a soldier? What type of, of uh, combat is he gonna try to suck the player into? Um, how does the monster punish the player? You're talking again about behaviors. When the player does the wrong behavior, what's the outcome to the player? What, what way is he gonna punish him? Is he gonna make the player uh, not survive to the next uh, save point? Is he gonna punish him by destroying his weapon or taking away his weapon? Will he punish the player by blinding him or uh, disorienting him in some way? There's lots of different ways that you can punish a player besides just killing him. Um, what player behaviors is the monster trying to encourage or discourage? So if this one lives in the water, you're encouraging the player to stay away from the water. If this one likes to cling to the ceiling, what you're encouraging is you want the player to be watching the ceiling at all times. Think about the, uh, the zombie dog in Resident Evil. Usually, you know, when you talk to people with the, the original uh, Resident Evil, that dog scared the hell out of people when it jumped through the window. Um, and after that, after that dog jumped through the window, it didn't matter that it never happened again in the game. Every other window you ever walked past, you looked at kind of differently. Um, so you were encouraging the player with that one moment to say windows are dangerous. So uh, when you're designing a monster for a, for a horror game, think about what kind of behaviors do I want my player to exhibit? Do I want them to be afraid of windows? Do I want them to be afraid of the dark? Do I want them to be afraid of water? Um, you can create monsters that actually encourage or discourage those behaviors. Uh, how does the monster move through your environment? Uh, you really can't start designing levels for a horror game until you have those monsters worked out. Because the way that your monster is going to use his environment and move through his environment is actually going to have a massive effect on the, the layout of your levels. Um, so that's one of the first things we looked at. Um, and then you get into sort of the, the, the more psychological and, and uh, uh, you know, less tangible things about the monster. What is his backstory? That's when you can start worrying about what information am I going to put in the game guide about what this monster is about. Um, and then you can start worrying about how does this monster reflect the dark side of my hero. Uh, or of ourselves, of humankind in general. Um, but you can't start answering those questions until you answer those kind of core gameplay mechanics stuff first. Um, and I just love this quote. I'm going to end, end my monster discussion with this quote.